Good evening. I'm Tracy Lester. I'm the executive director here at the Center for Fiction, and we are so happy to have you with us. Tonight is a special night and an exciting night. We are here to introduce you to the Center for Fiction, Susan Camel Emerging Writer Fellows, and to hear a final reading from our amazing 2021-2022 cohort. The energy around this night is always tremendous. As we welcome our new cohort of fellows, they will join with a community that has grown over the years, and that includes some of the leading voices in the literary world. As you know, or as you may know, the Center for Fiction is the only literary organization in the United States solely devoted to the art of fiction. We support the field by uplifting fiction and storytelling in all its forms, and we offer a vibrant home for readers and writers. Tonight is one of the best examples of how we do our work here at the Center for Fiction. It's a signature moment in our fellowship program. Of course, we couldn't do it without the support of our board of directors, our friends, and supporters. In particular, thanks to the initial contributors of the Center for Fiction Susan Camel Award for Emerging Writers, including Penguin Random House, Macmillan, Maria Campbell, Kathy Robbins, Stuart Applebaum, Bob Cohn, Barney Karpfinger, Julie Barr, Joni Evans, Jenny Witherell, and Salman Rushdie. And thanks to all the major supporters of this program, including the Jerome Foundation, Amazon Literary Partnership, and Penguin Random House. Your support means so much to us. Now, I know you're excited to hear from our fellows, um, but first I'd like to introduce to the stage Randy Winston, who is the Center for Fiction's Writing Program Manager. Greetings and salutations. Well, y'all really came out in a rainstorm. How about it? Um, I want to thank a few folks before we get started. Uh, Matt Kafori, our art director. Celeste Kaufman, our PR and marketing manager. Our events team, Melanie McNair, our director of public programs, Eliana Cohen-Orth, event production coordinator, and our events interns. Jory Southers, our bookstore manager, our bookstore staff, Scott Williamson Jr., our cafe and bar manager, and our cafe and bar staff, all of my colleagues upstairs on the members floor, and Tracy Lester, who helps me think through what these events and what these programs will look like. Um, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes here at the Center for Fiction, and um, it's, it's, you know, it's been a journey, and I really, really appreciate the support from the staff that we have here. Um, so let's get started. This is the uh, second installment of two readings for the 2021-2022 Susan Camel Emerging Writer Fellows, the final reading, unfortunately. Um, the Center for Fiction is a home for readers and writers, storytellers in all forms. And I like to joke that in that home, I oversee several Rings, wings, we call them programs, but they're wings tonight. This is like a home estate, if you will. And uh, one of my favorite wings is the Susan Camel Emerging Writer Fellowship. The fellowship is entering its 12th year. That's nine fellows annually. That's over 100 writers whose lives have been impacted by this program. The selected nine New York-based writers are awarded $5,000 and are granted access to all the center's resources, including our library, which celebrated its 200th year in 2021, our writing workshops, public events, discounts in our bookstore, voice and performance instruction via our partnership with Audible by the great Sarah Montague, and a place to write in our writer's studio. Hey, Sarah. Um, we, also, we also give our fellows access to our network. They are paired with editors in the industry a mentorship model, and meet publishing professionals such as agents, senior editors, authors, VPs, and publishers in intimate settings via our monthly dinner series. This year, we received over 700 applications for the 2022-23 fellowship cohort. With the help of our community of readers, we selected 42, 46 submissions. With the help of three judges, Raluca Albu, Ian Denning, K. 
Kara Blue Adams, all three alums of the program. We were able to, from 46, select nine recipients. And with that, I would like to introduce you, the Center for Fiction community, to the new 22-23 Susan Camel Emerging Writer Fellows. I'll call their names and show them some love. Diana Cole. Emmanuel Lachaud. Han Chang. Jia Ming Tang. JP Infante. Juliana Roth. Natalie Adler. Sabrina Helen Lee. Sarah Abulafia. You know, as I say to the, co to the current fellows often, my job here is to equip you with the knowledge and tools needed to navigate this industry, not just as writers, but as literary citizens. That's, that's the work. Um, my hope is that this work continues well after this fellowship, uh, that you continue to grow in the work you do for yourselves and the work that you do for each other. You've earned this. I look forward to working with all of you. Congratulations. All right. Um, fall and winter are great seasons. The start, <laughs> the, start, the start of fall has not been a disappointment. You all get to hear from the nine recipients of our current fellowship. The Yankees are up in the series. I'm sorry to all you Mets fans. Uh, the Center for Fiction's public programs are well underway. You can view those upcoming events on our website, and we can put away those window air conditioning units. Um, tonight, I want to run you through the rules real, real quick, and then we'll get started. Uh, each reader will read for three minutes. That's nine total, three minutes each. We good? All right. My job is to get you in and out of here, folks. Celebratory, but in and out. Lastly... Lastly, in the spirit, in the spirit of the fall season, I ask the fellows for a favor. Now, I've never been apple picking before, but my friends from college and folks in the neighborhood have told me that it's an important part of the fall season celebration. <laughs> now, I'd planned to go with friends, and uh, we were going to go on a road trip upstate. I don't know if you call one and a half to two hours of driving or riding on the train or road trip, but that's what we're going to call it tonight. Um, I had a playlist ready, and folks, I dropped the ball. I missed the apple picking window. We all did, me and my crew. Um, but our emerging writer fellows here tonight were kind enough to share with me the first song from their road trip playlist. You will hear about these songs as I read their intros. <laughs> Let's get started. Let's get started. Our first reader of the night is Caleb Gale. The first song Caleb would have on his road trip playlist is Golden Time of Day by Mays and Frankie Beverly. Caleb's first book, We Refuse to Forget, A Story of Black Creeks, American Identity and Power debuted on June 7th of this year. Congratulations. <clears throat> the title of the piece he'll be reading from tonight is First Day. Caleb, will you read for us, please? Yeah. 
Good evening. Okay, I, I know I have three minutes to read, but I'm going to waste a little bit of it just to remind you all that um, I'm the son and grandson and great-grandson and who knows how many great-grandsons of preachers of black churches. And so when we say good evening, we expect good evening back. So we're going to... And I know Randy is, is someone who likes to write about religion, so we're just going to do this one more time. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> there it is. There it is. I'm going to keep it quick, all right? I'm going to read real fast. The sun hasn't pierced the clouds yet, but the flickering light attached to your busted ceiling fan has been glinting for the past three hours, and you haven't slept long enough to figure out why. But if you're honest with yourself, the flickering of the light hasn't kept you awake. You slept without lights, with lights, some hot, some neon, some with sounds of the slight rattle of katydids and moths rapidly scratching their rib noise-making legs and flapping their wings in an odd, seemingly magnetic orbit around other lights. <clears throat> you slept in natural light, lightning storms, tornadoes, and earthquakes environmentalists say were caused by fracking in your home state. You stayed asleep during the lights of fireworks, fireplaces, campfires with the sounds of coyotes. I'm from Oklahoma, so coyotes. And other country bumpkins mimicking wolves by howling into the night. The lights aren't keeping you up. The lights don't have you up before 5.30 a.m. trying to count the changing flickers per minute. You're up because today you have to wear a suit, a nice suit, the kind of nice suit that doesn't make what you'd call a bold statement. Now, this suit makes the statement that you belong, just like the Rets, to no stripes with pins, no dots, not lines across or down. You went to bed at 1 a.m. only to wake up at 3 a.m. to stay up restlessly, thinking till 5.30 a.m., counting flickers to steal the nerves, unnerved by the requirement to not stand out, to be carbon copied the same. It was time to wear a suit. It was time to fit and put on this suit match with that tie, take off the tie. Is that a wrinkle on the right arm? Fumble through the sock draw. Damn, I got a sock draw. Damn it, the socks are loud, but they make a splash. You're different, right? So splashes are okay, but only to some extent. Am I right? But you don't need to be different. Grab the black pair, thin gauge, come up to the knee, just like the old deacons at the church taught. Get the knee highs, boy. That way you don't get ashy at the ankles. And you are dark. No one will see that dry skin. That's what the old deacons used to say. Take off the suit. It's gray, charcoal, not too light, not too dark, but gray enough to make somebody wonder why you pick gray and not blue or dark. Charcoal like every other guy. Grab the navy blue suit. Shawl collar, not notch, not peak, just round. The shirt, a white button-up, slight herringbone, stitching to catch the eye of a stranger, but you know the stitching will only catch your eyes, the eyes needing to feel like they exist inside a black face that belongs inside that room. Grab the tie, tie the tie, double Windsor, dipple under the knot, tip of the tie, hitting the top notch of the belt, or at least tip the dangling over the belly, dangling over the buckle of the belt that is supposed to match the color of the shoes, but no one can see the belt, they only can see your gut. Fuck. Is that sweat? Cut on the AC unit. Pull the chair close to the AC unit and sit. Don't move because your heart is racing at a pace that can make the slightest step on the creaky wooden floor of the four floor walk up spark perspiration from the skin through the shirt that you spent $113.74, which you only remember because you're one of the students who has to track spending down to the cents. So you sit, don't move, inhale deep and exhale slow. You start the clock 67 minutes until 8 a.m., but the sweat is still pouring. You have to walk 0.8 miles. You checked six months ago when you realized you were moving to Boston, and this 0.8-mile walk would become your daily commute. Don't ever read from a computer, because then windows pop up randomly. <laughs> Storm me off my flow. <clears throat> you checked last month when you moved into apartment number 11 on the third floor of the Georgian-style building on Prescott Street in Cambridge. You checked yesterday morning when it was 85 degrees and balmy and only the way Boston Metroplex can be in August. You checked yesterday afternoon when it was 92 degrees and you decided to test out the walk. No, not for how quickly the walk would exasperate you, but quickly, how quickly it would perspire you and how quickly you could stop perspiring. But before the door would open and the stranglehold of the humidity had wrapped its metaphorical grip around your windpipe, the sweat paired with the stickiness rested control of your shirt, your shorts, 
And if you're being honest, your underwear, both their shape and their shade. By the time you reach the conclusion of your point eight mile walk in 20 minutes, it took 31 minutes for the sweat beads to evaporate. So you know that shirt buttoned up to the top, a tie tied tight, pants matching the jackets and the cufflinks make dryness on this day, this important day impossible. So to minimize the sweat, pack two black washcloths, not white ones because the white ones will become black ones real soon. Leave now so you can walk slowly and still make it in time for the 8 a.m. start time, but arrive by 725 to account for the extra clothing. Plus the sun is finally out and it's booming against the black top, much like it'll do to your skin. Boy, you're about to sweat today. Our next reader is Gina Chung. The first song on Gina's road trip playlist is Tiny Dancer by Elton John. She'll be reading from her forthcoming novel, Sea Change, which will be out in April 2023. Gina Chung. Hello all, thank you so much for being here on this incredibly rainy night. Um, it is such a joy to be here in this space and to share this stage with so many incredible writers. And congratulations as well to the incoming fellows. I'm so excited for all of you. Um, I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my novel, Sea Change. And um, this is a scene from my protagonist's childhood in which she and her father take a trip to the aquarium where her father works and she has her first encounter with someone who will become very important to her. We took an escalator up to the second floor, where a neon sign welcoming us to the fountain aquarium lit up the polished tiles of the mall floor in a wash of color. There was already a line out the door of adults and small children, many of them younger than me, but we walked up to the front, where my father flashed his staff pass at a girl with green hair who waved him in. Inside, the aquarium was dark and quiet and lit with blue, as though we were all suspended inside the heart of the ocean. A giant paper mache eyeball glared at us from the ceiling. A sign nearby proclaimed that the eyeball was an approximation of what the eyeball of the fabled kraken would look like. Is that who we're seeing? I asked my father. The kraken? I taught you better than that. Krakens aren't real. But Dolores is, he said, grinning. We walked past the guards and down the grand exhibit hall, taking a quick right and then a left to where a crowd was gathered outside a giant single tank in a darkened room lit by violet-colored light. A guide was speaking in front of a large crowd of tourists, mostly old men wearing belts to hold up their khaki shorts and old women wearing visors. The Enteroctopus delflaney is the largest known cephalopod, the guide said. She had purple lipstick and seemed to be chewing gum. Who can tell me what a cephalopod is? The visors and the belts looked askance at her. One man took a picture of the dark tank, and the white star of his camera rippled across the dark. Sir, please don't, started the guide. But then we all saw what was inside the tank, and a gasp ran through the crowd. A cluster of red-purple arms and suckers waved at us, like flames in the dark water. The octopus pushed herself off the ground and drifted lazily through the eddies and bubbles of the water. She was a volcano, a flower, a starburst. She seemed curious to see us, but at the same time, completely indifferent. She finally settled herself on the floor of her tank, where she lay like a giant curled hand and watched as everyone stared. She turned banana yellow, then silver, then an iridescent green. What is it? I asked my father. I had reached for his hand without even realizing it. Back then, I was always trying to avoid holding on to my parents, the old instinct to cling to them, fighting against a new one, which was to seem as detached from them as possible. This is Dolores, he said. Isn't she beautiful? And as if she could hear us, Dolores ballooned back up towards the top of the tank. She soared through the water like a kite leaving a trail of bubbles in her wake. Thank you. Our 
Our next reader is Jen Liu. <laughs> Faye Wong's cover of Dreams by the Cranberries is the first song on Jen's road trip playlist. She'll be reading from the, pre from the piece titled Love, Look Away. Jen, will you read for us, please? I, I asked for that. Um, definitely want y'all to reaffirm how good I look tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so before I start, just a quick thank you to Randy, Tracy, Linda, and the rest of the staff at the center for making our year so special. Um, thank you to my talented and extremely good-looking cohort um, and all of our extremely good-looking supporters. Um, and a huge congratulations to the new class of 2023. You're in for a very good time. So I'm going to be reading an excerpt from a short story in progress called Love, Look Away. I think the only thing you really need to know is that the two main protagonists of the story, uh, they grow up in a Korean-American church, but that church has some like peculiar rules, including um, arranged marriage and arranged marriage between um, other races, and it's kind of based on two women I knew growing up who grew up in a church like this. Sue and Mimi grew up with the same bright auburn hair and Asian features. When they first met, they bonded over the loneliness of having to explain who they were and why they look the way they do. Sue's father is a hippie from Vermont, and her mother was a runner-up for Miss Korea in 1979. I don't believe in all of this stuff, she tells Mimi, but my parents told me that they would keep on paying for school if I came here. Sue is the oldest of four, and her mother expects her to set an example for the others. She wears corduroy pants with letterman jackets and studies marine biology in Florida. Sue gave her the ring at the end of last year's ceremony. It's a mood ring, like the ones you can buy at the supermarket, and it changes color depending on your body temperature. Sue seemed relieved to walk away from the proceedings unmatched. I'm not sure how long I can keep on pretending, she says. Mimi doesn't know if Sue is referring to her religion, her lifestyle, her sexuality, or all three. She thinks of her own parents, of the way that they live past one another, and she knows that a person can keep on pretending for a very long time. I'm so glad that we met, Mimi says, and gives Sue a hug. She lingers a bit to take in Sue's scent. It's a combination of violet and sandalwood, an elixir that she mixes herself so that she smells a little different every time that you meet her. Sue smiles. I bet you are, she jokes, before taking off one of the rings on her finger and handing it to Mimi. They watch as she tries it on, and they marvel as it fits her perfectly. Even their bodies match. They are life-size cutouts of one another. Blue means that you're feeling calm and well-rested, Sue explains. Red means that you're afraid. Purple means that your luck is changing. The ring turns a silky pink, the same color as the inside of a shell. What does pink mean? Mimi asks. Pink means that you're in love, Sue replies. She cocks one eyebrow up as she smiles. Her bluster is one of the things Mimi admires most about her. Stop lying, she says, hitting Sue, Sue on the shoulder. The performance lands harder than she expected, and Sue pouts as she massages the pain. The moment passes, but Mimi knows that this hit, this temporary loss of control, reinforces exactly what she's trying to hide. She stares at Sue's lips, which are the same pink as her affections. It doesn't take a ring to tell her exactly how she feels. Thank you. Our fourth reader is Na Zong. The first song on Na's playlist is I'm Gonna Be 500 Miles by The Proclaimers <laughs> because she's ambitious. She'll be reading from her new project, but travelers must be content. Na, the stage is yours.
Good evening. Um, I'm not from the tradition of preachers, um, <laughs> but I'm moonlight as podcaster, so this will do, hopefully. <laughs> um, I'm going to read from my new project, a novel about playwright who fled from Red Shanghai to New York in the 50s and found the protagonist of her anti-communism play come to life. The playwright is based on my favorite writer, Aileen Chan, and the novel is titled, But Travelers Must Be Content. At the beginning of this chapter, the protagonist is at a writer's residency working on her play. When I woke up, the weather was still very dramatic. The sky was of the same shade it had been in the morning, but from the flickering lamps in the distance, I could tell that it was near dusk. I eased the door open and found a piece of grilled fish and a small earthenware jar of chicken soup inside. Both were still lukewarm. I finished the soup and felt better. I sat down in front of my desk and flipped through the manuscript I had been working on. I wasn't lying when I said I never had any writer's block when writing in Chinese. I wrote in a hybrid language of Shanghainese and Mandarin with a sprinkle of some street slang and Anhui idioms that I picked up from my childhood nanny, a foul-mouthed, sexist, rural woman who gave me lots of inspiration for the locals in the fictional village where my play was set. Writing this language felt like running a pair of sharp scissors through a piece of silk. There was no resistance. Even when I made mistakes, I knew how to fix it. When I switched to English, I suddenly became conscious of this tool in my hand, chunky and unwieldy and not always going where I intended. Besides, wasn't it weird to have a bunch of communists and villagers speaking to each other in English? I'd been slower with the play than I would have liked. Now that December was halfway through and the Christmas cohort reading was on the horizon, all I had was a few pages, half of them stage description, and dramatis persona. I had trouble inhabiting my characters, until now. I picked up my fountain pen and started writing. I'd been stuck for three days at Act 1, Scene 2. The communist and his friend arrive at the village in the evening. Depleted from the trip, they ask the villagers for a hot meal. But the villagers, having had a miserable harvest, are reluctant to spare any food with this baby-faced cadres. So they pretend that they can't understand a single word, the visitor said. The communist, speaking in Mandarin. Comrades, we're starving. Do you have any porridge left? Village woman one, speaking in an exaggerated rural dialect. What? Friend of the communist, have you received a letter from Yan'an? We're here to help you set up a play. But we need to eat first. We're so cold and hungry. Village woman one, shaking her head resolutely. I don't know what you're saying. Lee's village is that way. This is Zhao's village. The communist, growing slightly impatient. Give us something to eat. Anything will do. Village woman one, retreating into her cottage. I will draw you a map. Village woman two, following village woman one, whispering. What's the matter, sis? Village woman one, in a fluent local dialect. Shut up, what do we eat after we feed those little scumbags? Who knows if they're cadres or not? The communist, utterly frustrated, storms off the stage. I chuckled as I wrote these lines, feeling the young man's frustration and bewilderment. These women are not unfriendly, but from them, he feels something even worse than antagonism, indifference. With a profound sense of self-pity, he sneaks into a deserted storage barn and falls asleep under a stack of dried hay. I could still sniff the sweet smell of hay when I put my pen down. My surroundings were hushed. The storm had finally subsided. For tonight, it seemed, I had no trouble believing that I was in the ramshackle barn on the other side of the world, the ground covered with dried donkey dung and chicken feces, babies wailing for milk in candlelit rooms. But such an illusion would be shattered the moment I walk out of this room tomorrow morning. I would see the undulating hills and frozen finger lake, I would see upon the dark soil hundreds of apples falling from the branches no one cared to harvest. They just let them rot. Thank you. Our next reader is Joshua Borja. The first song on Josh's road trip playlist is The Wizard and I from Wicked. He will be reading from his piece titled Glimpses, Joshua.
Hi, I'm Josh Borja. I'm reading from Glimpses. A Glimpse. My great aunt passed away when I was in high school. In the garage, in the vast black bags of papers, which my dad had tied up for garbage collection the next morning, I found a letter that she had received in 1970 from the local civil registrar of their hometown in the Philippines. My dad's snoring wafted up from the basement. This is to certify that the certified true copy of your birth certificate could not be furnished by this office due to the burning of the municipal building together with all the public records during the encounter between the American Liberating Forces and the Japanese soldiers sometime in February 1945. Earlier that evening, my dad had told me not to go through the papers. Bad luck to read the letters of the dead. A glimpse. In the film, Freedom Writers, based on a high school class's actual journal entries, Erin Gruel and her students hosted a speaking event with guest Miep Hees, a Dutch citizen who had helped hide Anne Frank's family from the Nazis. My aunt would come on Fridays to watch me and my brother, and on some weekend afternoons, she would take me to see a movie at Willowbrook. A glimpse. Midnight, knee deep in the snow, I walked through the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. Denkmal für die ermordeten Juden Europas, a 19,000 square meter concrete maze. The memorial stands along Hannah Arendtstrasse, the street in Berlin named after the writer whose report on the banality of evil reflects in part on translation problems during the trial of SS Obersturmbannführer Adolf Eichmann. A glimpse. For my U.S. history presentation in high school, I recorded several video interviews with my maternal grandmother. When the Imperial Japanese Army invaded the Philippines, she was 19 years old. The military, the Japanese military, converted her family's house into a barracks. She served as a first lieutenant in the Women's Auxiliary Corps under the United States Army. What will happen to my external hard drive when I die? A glimpse. As part of the research process for a fiction workshop, I interviewed my father and took notes on Microsoft Word. I asked him about his mother's experience under four years of Japanese occupation. During the initial invasion, her father had been beaten and killed near a train station on the way home. When she was about 12 years old, Japanese soldiers opened fire on civilians as she was selling fish at the market. She grabbed her younger cousin's hand and ran across the field with everyone else. When the gunfire stopped, she looked back and saw all the bodies, red, scattered in her wake, as if she herself had carelessly dropped them along the way. She and her cousin were among the few survivors of that massacre. Does a writer have the right to tell their own family's story? even the chapters that had happened before they became part of it. Thank you very much. I have to make sure I don't forget my gift. The fellows gifted me with a, with a coffee mug. It's the Last Supper with all our faces on it. Our next reader, our next reader is Cindy George. The first song on Cindy's road trip playlist is Protect Your Neck by Wu-Tang Clan because it's cinematic. It's also Cindy's superhero anthem. The story she's reading from is currently untitled. Cindy, will you read for us, please? everyone. The last year was so great, so I'm, I'm really thankful for the opportunity from the center and also my other fellows. I'm reading an excerpt um, from a short story about two women who were in a situationship 
before the pandemic and are now trying to navigate the world and each other um, as the world changes. Another dog had died, the seventh on the street. One of the elderly white neighbors told Larray about it that morning. Larray didn't know the woman's name and the woman didn't know hers, though they lived on the same floor of the same co-op for years. She could tell by the way the lady ignored the doorman that she wasn't worth befriending, but they had both known and liked Pedro, a puzzled looking beagle from one of the upper levels, now deceased. How he'd waddle up the entryway with determination, gripping a stick between his teeth, that was useless to all but him. And he'd played so well with Larray's own dogs, a nervous basset hound named King and a Pomeranian Queenie who had enemies. <laughs> Before Pedro, there had been Sophie and Chewbacca, the twin Yorkies, Starsky and Hutch, Hope John Paul, who died suddenly, and Scout, who trudged dutifully to the vet for weeks, the tumor poking out of his fur. <laughs> <laughs> They were old, like everything else around here, said Jamila, who was pretending to care, but only partially. Slouched low at Larray's table, she waved a hand to indicate that old meant Larray's building, Larray's neighbors, possibly even Larray herself. They had more than a decade between them, though Larray claimed to be six years younger than she was. A fair trade-off. She had slept through the 2010s and woken just in time for the pandemic. <laughs> old as hell, Jamila said again, do you hear me? So nature stepped in, that's just life. She looked aggrieved. It was late and the kitchen was not her favorite place to be. But Larray, with her need for company, was trying to keep her there. They weren't though, not all of them, Larray frowned. Sophie was just a puppy. You never know it could mean something. Jamila removed her coat though she insisted on keeping it within reach. When she'd called that morning, there had been a note of warning in her voice. I got somewhere to be later, she said. I don't have time to sit up all night with you. Still, she'd shown up and accepted a glass of wine, which Larray poured as if there was something to celebrate. They drank a lot during the pandemic, mostly together, but also alone. And Larray knew Jamila didn't always bother with glasses. She shoved the bottle to her teeth and took it straight with her feet up on the chair, like someone who worked. <laughs> Back then, Larray would have told her to keep her feet off the furniture, trying not to sound like a parent, but it was the sort of thing she'd always told her own children. Now Larray tried not to notice. Now she cleared off the junk on the chair across from Jamila so that she could do whatever she wanted with her feet. Jamila looked from, from Larray's droopy face to the hounds. He had fallen asleep at his food dish, his mouth open, his head in his kibble. I think that one's already dead. He had a long day, Larray said. I walked him late. He had a long day, Jamila repeated. I haven't slept in 72 hours. I've been everywhere and back. She looked less attractive, slumped over, and her makeup didn't quite work under the kitchen lights. It required a different, more deceptive kind of setting. She was probably on her way to a club downtown. They were open now, and her club friends were starting to move back to the city, and she made new friends all the time because people were willing to talk and crack jokes again. Life had gone back to normal, Jamila said as if she alone had the power to decide it. She was predictable in that way. The problem was that Larray wasn't predictable at all. She waited to see what she would do or say, like an outsider watching herself. She heard a voice ask God for signs and realized it was her own. Before the thing with the dogs, there had been the thing with the flies. Larray was sure there were more of them, an unnatural amount that behaved in unnatural ways. She had stood in the parking lot, transfixed by a swarm near her car, noting their high agitation. It felt biblical, apocalyptic, and though she rarely thought to record anything, she had recorded that and sent it to Jamila. It had turned out to be nothing, but the thing with the dogs could be something. It always started with the animals first. Everybody thinks the worst is over, but maybe it isn't, Larray said. She lived in a building of retired seniors in Riverdale, the Bronx, who'd always been nasty, but were now somehow worse as agitated as the insects Larray observed by her car. Two men with canes had fought over the tiny TV in the laundry room and needed to be separated. Someone had torn through the mask optional signs in the elevators. Why wouldn't God be looking to swat them all again, she said. They hadn't learned. He kind of sounds like you, Jamila said. She put a hand on the back of Larray's thigh, bare where the shorts cut off, fatter now than when the pandemic started. 
There was promise in that touch, but Lorraine had not been born with the right instincts to encourage promise. She did not know, for example, how to keep the hand interested. By the time she thought, yes, I will lay my hand on top of hers, it had already been pulled away. Now the hand was reaching for the expensive looking jacket. The hand was pulling hard at the buttons with no regard for how the strain might loosen the threads so that the next time the hand reached to slide the button through the hole, it would find that the button had disappeared altogether. The hand was reaching for a bag that screamed some designer's name, and Larray could see the rest of her own evening at home, with the one drooling dog passed out in its kibble, and another that she had not convinced yet to love her. She said aloud what she had meant to say only to herself. Shit. Thank you. Our next reader, our seventh reader, is Katie Yee. Katie's first song on the road trip playlist, oh, we have two. I'm Gonna Be Me, 500 Miles by the Proclaimers. I love the one episode of How I Met Your Mother, where this is the only song that plays on their CD in the car. So it's a different meaning for the different songs. She'll be reading from her novel in progress, tentatively titled A Woman a man and a woman walk into a bar, or Maggie. Katie, will you read for us, please? I feel like there was not nearly enough recognition about that How I Met Your Mother episode. It's very good. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight on this very rainy day. I know I've got one friend who came out from New Jersey. That's the real MVP. Um, thank you to everyone at the Center for Fiction for, for your hospitality and, and warm welcomes, and especially to Randy and Tracy and Scott, who keeps the margaritas flowing, tip your bartenders. Um, okay, I guess I'll just start reading for my novel. Um, I don't think you need to know anything, so here we go. I was folding linens when I first found out my children don't think I'm funny. I was by the hall closet, overhearing them ask my husband for a bedtime story. This was after I'd already read them, from Where the Wild Things Are, a book they used to love so much the pages were starting to pull from their binding. He reminded them of this, a good husband, and they told him, you'd tell it better, and so he did, a better father. It became a bad habit. I'd read them their story and try not to step on Lincoln logs on the way out. I'd begin to soak the pots and pans, and then I'd stand in the hall, at the bottom of the staircase, listening to them beg my husband for a better story. It was a small betrayal. The thing I noticed that was peculiar about my husband's telling is that the characters are all out of sorts. Night after night, he'd pluck a character from one book and drop it into another. The mismatchedness made them laugh. It's unexpected. It's not right. That's what makes it fun. Little Red Riding Hood turning up at her grandmother's house only to find, not grandma, not the wolf. No, but Sleeping Beauty instead. And my kids are in fits over it. It hurts in an unexpected way, like doing yoga for the first time in a long while and realizing you can't bend the way you thought you could, a new soreness. I'm at Greenlight Books with my best friend Darlene. She's picking up Jeanette Winterson's Written on the Body to impress someone she likes. I think of early days, of the effort you make just to show someone you're interested. By the register, there are all these little tchotchke gifts for people you don't know well. The desk... <laughs> The desk calendars shine with their plastic and their promise of 12 inoffensive whales or covered bridges. There are also books on a spinning season shelf, the little book of Buddhism, love poems, and then there it is, the big book of anti-jokes. Darlene thinks I'm being dramatic when I tell her about the kids not finding me funny anymore. They used to find me hilarious, I protest. I try to balance the big book of anti-jokes on my head. Remember, is this a hat? They loved that one. Darlene hated that one. How many hours spent asking the same insipid question? But let me tell you something. Children are tickled by wrongness. Or maybe they just love knowing something that you don't. What do you call a joke that isn't funny? A sentence. <laughs> Want to hear something that'll make you laugh? Your face muscles. <laughs> a man and a woman walk into a bar. It sounds like the start of a very old joke, and it is. It is also the start of an affair. After my husband told me about Maggie, I started to feel an ache in my chest. It was a dull ache to the touch, but solid as stone. Darlene said I was manifesting my pain. 
If this were a different kind of story, the pain would give way to a Greek goddess daughter who would split open my breast and say something about feminism. Or it would reveal itself to be a hole, and my husband would get sucked up into it. Or it would need to be removed, and it would confound doctors, because it'd be a fig seed that turns into Sylvia Plath's fig tree of possible selves, and it would all be a big, fat, juicy metaphor. What really happened, a woman walks into an exam room, and it's cancer. There, that'll knock him dead. The thing I remember most about the biopsy is the paper robe. The paper robe is thin and crinkles every time you shift your weight. The paper robe is terribly unflattering. It lays flat across you, washes you in an awful, sickly white. It makes a blank box of you. The nurse who leads me into the small sonogram room is so quiet. The gel is cool on my skin. The goosebumps ripple up. She moves her wand around until the lump is located. It is the opposite of my first sonogram, my husband at my side, something good growing. I'm host to something terrible now. My body turned. Maybe he could tell. They say they'll call with the results in the next week. I find Darlene waiting in the designated room. We go to a nearby burrito place and get frozen margaritas. I cut my tongue on the salt along the rim. For once, we have very little to say to one another, and every room becomes a waiting room. Thank you. Our eighth reader is Jared Jackson. Jared's first song on the Road Trip playlist is Put It On by Big L. He will be reading from his piece titled Ace, Jared Jackson. So I'm the uh, second and last reader, so you're going to have to uh, bear with me for like two extra minutes, quickly. Um, quickly, I just want to thank everyone involved in making this program um, and this fellowship and tonight possible. Um, Terry, who started the program with us, all the folks behind the scenes, and especially Randy Winston, who's faithfully stewarded us uh, to, the, to tonight. Um, it's been a really wonderful experience, and I couldn't be more thankful. Also, um, I don't know if people do this, but... Um, I'd like to dedicate my specific reading to a dear friend of mine. Um, his name is Vijay Mansukhani. Um, he passed away uh, roughly six months ago. Today would have been his 29th birthday. Um, our last conversation was in March. Um, I had just published a short story a week or two before, and he FaceTimed me because that's what he did. He never texted or called. He FaceTimed. Um, in short, he jokingly chastised me for not telling him about a new story out um, and that he had to find out via social media. In truth, I didn't send it to anyone individually um, because I have this aversion to promoting myself in that way or being outwardly proud in that way, even though by the end of the conversation, he had told me he was proud of everything I was doing. In return, I told him I'd personally let him know the next time I published something. He died suddenly a couple weeks later. Um, so tonight is his birthday, this reading's for him, but it's also an opportunity to tell my fellow cohort members that I'm proud of each and every one of you. Um, you should be outwardly proud of yourselves um, as you continue to share with the world, and especially those close to you, the art to which you've decided to dedicate an aspect of your life, and that goes to new cohort too. Um, I'll be reading a short, uh, the beginning section from a short story called Ace. That's a part of a story collection of mine titled Locals, um, which follows the lives and dreams and shortcomings of young folks in Hartford, Connecticut. Once, maybe twice a month, the money was flowing right. My parents would get laced in their flies gear to try to run the streets like they used to. By then they were pushing 60, not old, but not young either. Growing up, the old heads I called aunts and uncles would all tell me how they all used to party together three or four nights a week and how my parents were the ringleaders. That all changed when I was born, they said. My parents had a quick 180, shifted their priorities. My arrival turned them into homebodies, made them more comfortable in loose-fitting pajamas, lined house slippers, and a cup of tea at the ready, then shirts dripped in sweat, feet cramped in slick, stylish shoes, and a glass of fire water waiting to coat their throats. But every now and then, my father finagled his way out of a Saturday morning shift, delivering packages for FedEx. He strolled into our second floor apartment on a Friday night, tossed his keys on the table, found whichever room my mom was squatted in, and leaned, pa leaned his head past the door frame to say, we're going out tonight. You'd think my mother would find this sweet, the spontaneity of it all, like in those old-timey movies where the husband comes home to tell his wife to throw on our best clothes, they're hitting the town, the wife drops whatever she's doing to turn on the stereo and crank up the volume to her favorite song, put on her face in the bathroom, all while her husband admires, admires her from behind, swaying side to side, shadowing his wife's tempo, both of them smiling at each other in the reflection of the mirror. This was real life, and in my real life home, my mother didn't like surprises. You're just telling me this now, she'd say. 
I'm telling you when I could. Phones don't exist no more. How you expect me to call you when I'm on the truck? You figure out a way to call me when you want to know what I'm making for dinner, don't you? When you want to complain, talking about chicken again, as if you're the one who does the grocery shopping after working, after cleaning, and after everything else I do. So what you saying? You don't want to go out? I didn't say that. <laughs> then say what the fuck you mean. My father will respond, raising his voice, the only way he felt seen. <laughs> Is yelling supposed to scare me? My mother would laugh. I'm not yelling, I'm... My father would pause, collect himself, take a deep breath, say, I'm excited is all. They go on like this for a while. My father expected my mother to get ready in less time than it takes to boil water. My mother fretting around, trying to figure out who was going to watch my ass while they were out. The boy is fine, my father would say each time my mother began flipping through her phone book, searching for someone she deemed responsible enough to take care of me. I'm not leaving her alone, she'd reply. But as long as it ain't some woman again, he's already up under you and your girlfriend's enough. Well, maybe if you, maybe if I what? My mother would shake her head, biting her tongue so she didn't ruin the night before it started or waste the energy she would need to get ready. The showering, the wardrobe changes, the false eyelashes I helped her stick on. What about Leroy's boy? My father suggested one night. My mother kissed her teeth. I said Leroy's boy, not Leroy. Ace, he'd be fine. And it'd be good for Justin to spend time around someone like him. Someone like him. Someone who ain't a sissy, my father said, slowly, looking directly at me as the words spilled from his mouth, as if I hadn't shot out of his own balls. This wasn't the first time my father, Ace, my father suggested Ace, but my mother always said no, and mainly because of Ace's father, Leroy, who she considered to be worse than the scum that floats on the top of the pond at Keeney Park. Leroy grew up with my father in Jamaica in a little neighborhood of Kingston called Rockfort. Hopped over stateside around the same time, too. Had Ace in tow because, long story short, Ace's mother didn't want him. Was willing to give him up to a family member or a church or whatever option meant she could get rid of what she thought would only slow her down. Leroy, to his one redeeming credit, said nope to that. Left the woman to fend for herself in Kingston. Took his youth with him. After my mother and my father linked up, before I was even a thought, Leroy asked his brethren to ask his woman to put him on with my Aunt Ro, my, mo my mother's closest friend. My mother obliged because Aunt Ro thought Leroy was cute, had said as much the first time they all were in daylight together. Besides, they were grown folks with grown lives. No harm, no foul, right? If it didn't work out, it couldn't be that bad. But then Leroy screamed Aunt Ro out of lumps of cash, even took her to court for money he claimed she owed to him which was wild because anyone who knew Leroy knew that he was the type of cheap to insist that any date of his should cough up gas money if he used his car to take them out. But on this night, none of Leroy's previous antics mattered. My mother was out of options. Her friends were busy, and their kids were busy watching someone else's kids. It was stay in or see if Ace would work. And since it had been three moons since my parents stepped out together, she caved. Thank you. Our last reader of the night is Mary Wong. The first song on Mary's road trip playlist is anything the DJ plays to close out a night at a gay bar. <laughs> she will be reading from a piece titled Me, Mimi. Mary, will you read for us, please? Hello, everyone. I would like to echo what everyone has said already, but better. Thank you so much. We always, we never write alone, but always in community. And I'm so happy to be in the community here. I'll also shout out my partner, Christian, who's sitting there. Um, he teaches me every day how to be a better person, a better artist, and better at cleaning the kitchen. So thanks for that. Um, my, I'm going to read um, the opening monologue of my novel. Um, the novel is about um, an Asian supermodel whose career implodes once people start to discover she might not be that Asian after all. <laughs> it is certainly not autobiographical. <laughs> um, 
I chose to write a novel about a supermodel because, firstly, I want people to read it. Um, but secondly, because I wanted to explore the fuzziness of identity, and um, I found it hard to do that um, with some of the language I had at my disposal that is used in uh, popular discourse today. Um, and I realized that fashion is a discipline in which um, identity is judged on appearance. So I thought that it would be the perfect setting um, for my question. So here I go. I kind of don't want to start because this is the end of our year if I do. And I'm like, sorry, next cohort, I will start. <laughs> Beauty is hard work. I don't even remember the last time I took a shower for hygiene purposes only. The shower is the place where I exfoliate my epidermis, purify my pores, kick open my hair cuticles like a stubborn door and douse its parched and damaged core with a blast of keratin. I exfoliate the ideas that no longer serve me. I rub my body with products supporting causes I believe in. In this case, it's my own beauty line. <laughs> Look at this beautiful, glossy goop anti-gravity jelly my team has formulated. Smother your face in it, and you'll uncover a better version of your true self. My shower, my sanctuary. The echo makes my voice sound better. The mist blurs my fine lines. I bend over to study my toes. And even the crushed velvet stretching over my knuckles has disappeared. Did you know that a baby is born without any lines at the bottom of their feet? They only develop once the child is out, starts wiggling. It's the first sign of aging, and even worse, no one knows how to prevent it. <laughs> I step in front of my anti-fog mirror and study the cubist arrangement of features that is my face. My eyes are slanted and sharp, each nesting into their socket like the tick of a box. My nose consists of two microscopic vents, making it seem nearly miraculous that I am alive and breathing. <laughs> my lips bulge out as if a pink napkin has been stuffed into my mouth. I look like the subject of a Tang Dynasty painting who just got fillers in LA. The scale, the teacher, 119 pounds in weight, 5'10 in length, a beautiful BMI of 1707. Some models say there's no such thing as too skinny, but over the years, I've concluded it's not professional to swing more than one and a half pounds either way. That is, after you've reached what is both scientifically and aesthetically recognized as underweight, of course. A model's body is an extension of her face, it's a signature, a workhorse, and tinkering too much with, works, with what works is bad for business. I am a businesswoman, after all, and I have to take responsibility for my products. Product, actually, which is me. Mimi Tan is Mimi Tan's greatest investment. And, as I, as I, and I am, as most people know, Mimi Tan. A model, almost a super, I would have been had the attention span of this age not been so short, its energy so frazzled. Except for a Gigi or a Bella, any name nowadays is simply flotsam, riding the wave of trending searches. But I'm not like most girls. I survived turning 25, that critical moment when girls grow into a more mature type of beauty, or simply more mature. Now, at 33, I'm booking two campaigns a season, and my ass still looks like it's just been squeezed out of a tube. <laughs> I even survived the time when the modeling industry believed that market girls from Siberia or Bahia or Transylvania were more relatable than me, a face that looks like a people two billion strong. That era wanted underfed Caucasian nymphs, and that's simply just not me. But I didn't give up. I worked until my face was one that was in fashion, but more importantly, I learned something in the process. A model is always modeling. 
they say, but I realize that a model also has the model modeling itself. People want to peek behind the curtain to justify the cruel randomness of the genetic lottery. They want to see you rub on wrinkle cream and admit the feet to butter. They say they want to see your life, but what they're really looking for is your journey. And people want to know where you came from, even if that place is in the shower. Thank you. All right, all right. Um, well, all of our readers, please stand. All of our readers. Um, listen, I think about um, our check-ins. Um, I think about our overseas FaceTimes. I think about, um, you know, our talks about craft, our talks about life after the cohort. I think about you know, all of these things that we discuss during this year, and um, I'm forever indebted to you all. Uh, you made this first year memorable, and it's been better than I ever could have imagined. You introduced me to this space. Um, and for that, I'm, for, I'm forever thankful. I'm always here. I'm always your fan. I'm always your support. Whatever you need, whether that's help with query letters, connecting with agents, connecting with editors, even if you have one, connecting with other folks, whatever you need, you all know. I say what I say, I mean what I mean. I can back it up. Um, and lastly, uh, I think about how you all show up when you don't have to. When you, you show up when you don't have to. Because life says other things are more important. And I thank you all for being here for that. You know, I thank you all for being here. Um, I am outside of my realm sometimes when I, when I think about the work that you all are doing and the work that you all will do. And you all should be very, very proud of that. Um, so yeah, how about a round of applause for the fellow? I wish I could keep this going so y'all, the, the cohort does it in. Um, thank you so much. If you all would please stay here, I wanna, we're going to do photos. Uh, thank you all for being here on a rainy night. Thank you for the support, for the love. I appreciate it. The fellows appreciate it. The center appreciates it. Uh, cheers. Good night. Good night. Good night.